Aloha, this is Carrie Kim. Listeners, thank you for being with us today as we explore the potential of food forests with Jim Gale, CEO and Chief Storyteller of Food Forest Abundance. First, we'd like to thank the Tongva ancestors for their enduring presence, legacy, and stewardship of this area. The show comes to you from the ancestral homelands of the Tongva and all of their relatives. And we invite you to align with and support local First Nations, their homelands, and their lifeways wherever you live. Many people may be familiar with Victory Gardens that were hallmarks of World War I and World War II, where people in the US and other countries were growing food at home to supplement rations, reduce pressure on food supply, and also lift morale. We are in a similar yet different moment now. Having experienced food security and supply chain issues during the pandemic, the urgency of climate change as evidenced by flash floods, intensive wildfires, as well as civil wars, economic and humanitarian crises, uncertainties about energy, overburdened and aging power grids and rising food costs. These are all perfect motivations to grow food at home. During the pandemic, a quiet gardening boom began. Now roughly 42% of people are growing their own food. Food forests are a means to reconnect to the world around us, establish resilient communities, benefit the ecosystem overall, vitalize our health and restore habitat for pollinators and our animal relatives. Today, Jim Gale of Food Forest Abundance is here to share about the potential of thriving food forests to meet and transcend the issues of our times. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Carrie. I'm very excited and inspired to share this message with you and all of your listeners. The message I'm going to share today is, well, Victor Hugo put it well, he said, there's one thing stronger than all of the armies of the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share that idea in actionable detail with you all today. That's excellent. You are right on time, Jim. You had, you know, an exhilarating life as a world traveler. You're a successful entrepreneur. You've lived in places like Hawaii and Costa Rica for a long time. Uh, while in Costa Rica, you did a deep dive into permaculture, and I'm wondering what led you to learn permaculture while you were there. Oh, that was an interesting story. Um, I was actually developing a cattle pasture and turning it into a golf course community, and the first thing that we built was a fruit tree nursery. I've always mm -hmm. loved fruit trees, and I love the Costa Rican assortment of fruit. And not knowing that you could have a massive assortment all over the place, but we just don't know that because we've been programmed. This information has been programmed out of society. So I learned that the governments are not on our side, that, they're, that there's so many problems in the world that are not accidental. They're by design to control the people. And when I learned permaculture after developing this golf course community I was actually getting criticized by these, these two gals came into my office they started yelling at me for developing a golf course in this area mm -hmm. and I listened because I love taking in new information and they shared with me that permaculture was the solution not this type of thing and so anyway I dove in and I started learning permaculture through all of this stuff that was going on in my life at the time. I also had my first two daughters mm -hmm. and that was the most important thing because now I was looking at the world through a new lens, a more long-term lens. Like what's the world of my grandkids going to be like? Mm -hmm. And when I learned the government problems and I learned the problems of us destroying our natural resources at scale, and then I read Bill Mollison's quote. His quote was, um, though the problems of our world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. And I actually started to ball. And mm. I am an optimist. I sp I've spent the last 15 years basically obsessed with how do we bring these embarrassingly simple solutions to society at scale? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Congratulations on doing that. I really celebrate the fact that you are doing it and you're the exactly have exactly the kind of fortitude and um, you know that you're inspired to do something at scale, which is exactly what we need in the world. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that you had focused on the world's problems, and I guess that's what you meant, that you were recognizing um, the failures of government, recognizing that there was maybe collusion 
uh, and keeping keeping things from um, public view or or public action, and that you had to kind of confront those dark realities first. Yeah. And then now you've become this food forest champion. So was your learning in permaculture really more hands on that you were self taught in that, or did you have mentors in it in Costa Rica or? always mentors i have mentors throughout my whole life i'll go on youtube sometimes and some random person who does a food forest video becomes a mentor <laughs> i mean the plants are the best teacher when you mm -hmm. go out and you actually sit with nature and you listen and experience and you feel and you sense and observe and you get information you get feedback you look at the leaves of a plant and you say oh that's something that doesn't look right about that you can feel it Right? Mm -hmm. So I love mentors. They're everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess that started for you from a very early time because you were, you grew up in nature, you had that nickname of nature boy. And so it's not, not lost on you, this power of observation and connection with nature. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. There's something, and this is also scientific, the act of looking at a flower, the act of standing in a food forest will heal to, to a significant degree. And there's a lot of studies that have been done on this. It's pretty fascinating. A hundred percent. Well, there are studies that talk about how trees can feel and trees can recognize faces. Yeah. They can recognize you. Yeah. So it's, it's quite, it's quite astonishing. Wow. Could you describe what a food forest actually is? Yes. A food forest is a designed landscape to serve humanity, to serve, which also serves nature. It's a system where you, you use the permaculture principles. And by the way, what I'm speaking of, it has been, it's not a hypothetical solution to all of the world's biggest problems. It's a demonstrated and proven solution all over the world to all the world's biggest problems. When we simply design our societies to have local regenerative food supplies, when we expose the poisons and take out the poisons, of our society. And we use, like most HOAs and most communities have ornamental landscapes. Mm -hmm. What we call a food forest is a landscape that is not only ornamental and beautiful, but mm -hmm. it also produces food, which creates infinitely <clears throat> more life in that, in that landscape. Well, aren't you also working with some organizations like that now who are actually in putting food forests in their developments? Absolutely. We are, we've been hired to design whole communities, 35,000 person communities where we're designing using permaculture principles, the food forest and the permaculture systems in the community from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Where, where are some of those projects taking place? I actually just looked at a list on uh, Ian said that we're now in 16 countries. Now, considering we launched Earth Day 2021, about 16, 17 months ago, we're right. now in 16 countries and 43 states, and we've got cooperative partners all over the world. So we're basically, we've been in Poland and Germany and the UK and Brazil and Santao and Thailand and Canada and all over the place. So how are people finding you? Is it just something that's happening exponentially or I told two friends and they told two friends? I mean, how is it actually growing? I mean, yes. it's also kind of just the timing. It's the zeitgeist. It's the zeitgeist. There's a vibrational reality going on. We're in the, the apocalypse, which means lifting the veil. We're becoming aware of what the possibilities are and also what the problems are. And then the zeitgeist is it's an energetic shift. In fact, Tesla said, if you want to find the secrets to the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Well, I would say turn the word think into the word experience or feel. Mm -hmm. And when you can start feeling and rising our energies up, then we start connecting with new people and we start getting new ideas. It's a beautiful time to be alive. <laughs> um, could you explain the seven layers of a food forest so people better understand like the density of a food forest? Yes, absolutely. So typically there, there are 44 million acres of lawn in the United States alone. And a lawn is a one layer of green monochromatic pasta that takes more poisons and more chemicals than any other crop, but does not provide food. When we transition 50% of our lawns into a layered food forest, we will create the roots and tubers, the ginger and turmeric and taro and yucca and sweet potatoes and potatoes. And then the herbaceous layer, a lot of mushrooms and herbs on this layer. And then the smaller sh shrubs and fruit trees, a lot of medicinals and a lot of berries. 
And then the bigger bushes and, and um, like berry bushes and blueberries, raspberries, blackberries. And then you've got the smaller understory fruit trees and the larger food producing trees, a lot of big fruit trees and nut trees. And then you've got vining plants that go up the middle and cover all the fences and all the walls. So now you've got layers of food in the same area, creating mm -hmm. an infinite habitat and in abundance. Now, what is the smallest amount of area that you could actually create a functional food forest? A functional, a, a guild is a community of plants that serve and support each other. So to get into the details on that, you'll want some flowers, some beneficial insect attractors. You want to attract the butterflies and the pollinators. Then you'll have um, like chop and drop plants, like comfrey is a good one in mini zone, very hardy, and um, Mexican sunflower, and a lot of legumes like beans and peas, pigeon pea and bush bean, and a lot of different beans and peas. And they fix nitrogen in the soil. And then you'll have several berry bushes and maybe some turmeric and ginger. And then you'll have one fruit tree. So a one fruit tree guild can, will not only produce you the value from that fruit tree, but all of the other plants in the same footprint. So easily on 50, 60 square feet, you can have an incredible abundance of food growing per year. That's amazing. I mean, I know your focus is really, I think, in urban and suburban landscapes, correct? To really transform like these lawns and places that are basically kind of, uh, uh, basically essentially dead or, or sterile environments. They're dead sterile zones. You nailed it. They're biological deserts. They're void of what life should be in that area. Our target is the, the suburban lawn. That's like the zone one of the freedom of our, of our world is when we transition because it's good for us. This is the message that we love to convey is the odds of a family having cancer, diabetes, and heart disease when they go outside and they are able to harvest for basically free a meal every day. The odds of those diseases and diseases go down radically and the wallet expands and the bank account expands radically because these are abundance production systems that actually take less maintenance than a lawn. Yeah, and people don't realize that they're breathing or they're, you know, the people who are supporting um, the maintenance of their yard are being sprayed with chemicals or they're using Roundup and weed killers and pesticides. These things are affecting them, you know, and their health and everyone else's health as well. Yeah going into the air. For so sure. um, I, what do you have to say about these about people who are now installing synthetic turf and how do you reach them in time to get them to shift? I mean, not just to be able to plant a food for us, but it is a, a mentality shift as well. Yeah. So my passion, my obsession for 15 years has been to catalyze a shift in awareness that leads to mass adoption of the most logical thing we could ever do for ourselves, our families, our communities, and our world. So once people see and understand that there's a better way, then they will choose the better way. The word choice is almost always misrepresented because choice, the word implies that there's an awareness of choice, mm -hmm. but most people right. are programmed and there is no awareness. They're simply following the program. Awards are given to people who create the most sterile, dead, ridiculous, unnatural landscapes that there are. They mm -hmm. get awards for that, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to change that mentality by, by directly linking those landscapes to cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. And there is a link. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, lawns use more poisons than any other crop. Right. And poisons have been proven to cause cancer and all these other things. 100%. What do you have to say having way back in the day when you were working with that golf course, what do you have to say about golf courses now? Because pound for pound, the golf courses spread more pesticide, you know, than agriculture. The, so, so, and that's the problem with golf courses. Did they always do that? No. Do they have to do that? Absolutely not. The vision that I have of golf courses is line the fairways. First of all, take out the poisons, number one, and then line the fairways with all of these food producing plants, the experience of walking through that golf course will enliven on such a higher level than just hitting a little white ball around. 
and the animals, the birds, the butterflies, and all the animals, it'll be like walking through paradise. So it's a matter of first exposing the poison producers, like black rock, taking out the poisons, and then starting to use natural systems. I imagine someday when we are connected enough, like the mycelial network, where we will be able to sit in the ground, put our hands in the soil, and visualize with the actual nature itself and start creating literally by having that connection. Mm -hmm. Are you working with any golf courses? Have any taken this on? I'm just curious. No, but they will. They will. Because <laughs> what, I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. And here's why they will. Talk about a not, waste of water. Exactly. Not only, and, and they don't have to be. Like okay. if we use the crops and the different systems where water is actually saved and conserved and filtered, we turn the problem into the solution. Not only will golf, golf courses are failing at a rapid rate around the world right now as the economy is hitting the skids and all this, when we can then use that land as an asset where it's also producing food, now you've got infinitely more value in the land itself. Yeah, I mean, it's going to change. Plus the, the younger generation isn't necessarily tuning into golf. I don't think that you, we see them out on golf courses in the droves oh, that, you know, tuning the, into the, their the iPhone. generation. So renowned permaculturist, Jeff Lawton once commented that gardens are kids stuff, but that food forests are forever. Yeah. What do you have to say about his comment? He nailed it. I mean, I wouldn't say kids stuff. I wouldn't be degrading of gardens because I think gardens are incredibly valuable right now. We need annuals and perennials. What Jeff is talking about is perennial food forests, which you can plant a perennial food forest and walk away for 30 years, come back 30 years later, and as long as nobody has poisoned it or cut it down, it will literally be 10 times as big as it was when you mm -hmm. left. And mm -hmm. it'll be producing infinite, I mean, ridiculous amounts of abundance and food, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, annuals are plants like you plant once, you take the seeds from the harvest and you plant again. And they're incredibly important. The difference in timing is that annuals will provide food in 45 to 120 days. Perennials, they take a little longer to be established. Mm -hmm. right? So we need both right now. We need annuals planted in the food forest beds so we can have the short-term food supply issues solved along with the long-term. So you're always combining both. You're always doing both when you go. Into yes. And yes, exactly right. Until the point where the canopies fill in and now the sunlight is taken by the food forest, which is literally a forest of food everywhere. At that point, then the annuals won't be, uh, um, they won't flourish there because there's no sun hitting the right, canopy. The canopy. Mm -hmm, we'll have covered that. So what kind of timeline are we looking at from the time that someone begins a project, installs their food forest, Chill really becomes more self-sustaining, like yeah. what you're talking about at that point. Are we talking five years, eight years to it really at that flourishing point? Yeah. So in golf science, so we're building an off-grid community here in Central Florida to demonstrate freedom and to live a great life. It's on a private lake, and we've planted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of larger fruit trees and thousands of plants overall. And we planted one 18 months ago, one 12 months ago, and one six months ago, or seven. So it's like walking through time. Our seven month old food forest is producing an incredible amount of perennial spinaches, um, sweet potatoes, yucca, turmeric, taro, all that stuff. Now, you know, seven months is about right, but yet the avocado trees and the peaches and the mangoes and the lychees, those are maybe they have one or two fruit on them, right? Mm -hmm. In three years, they'll have 200 or 300 fruit on them, right? So it, it's a matter of a little bit of time. But you can, if you put the system in properly, yeah. and if there's a drought, you, irrigation is, is very important at the beginning. Once a system gets established, then irrigation is less important, especially if you build in the water systems like the swales. Mm -hmm. A swale is a ditch on contour, and it could be a foot wide and 10 feet long, or a mile wide and 100 miles long. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and talk a bit more about swales when we come back. Perfect. 
So Jim, we were talking about swales. If you could talk a little bit more and also about this terminology, swales on contour, because a lot of people don't know this terminology of permaculture. If you can explain really what that is and how that directs water and holds water and supports the food forest. I sure will. And if you know of any farmers out there, please share this bit of knowledge with them. So a, a swale is basically a ditch. And like I said, it could be a foot wide and 10 feet long or a mile wide and 100 miles long. And it's on contour. So, you know, every, land has curves where if it's on a, on a hill like this, you never want to plant your crops in rows that are going down the hill. Water will come down and it'll just flood right down the hill and it'll take the topsoil and the nutrients right along with it. You put a swale at the top of that hill on contour. So in other words, the swale is basically level. And now when the water comes down the hill like this, it hits the swale and it spreads out, it slows down and it sinks in the land. So what does that do? Well, as water's running over the land, it'll gather nutrients and it'll take those nutrients sometimes to the river or the lake or the ocean. You don't want those nutrients going there. You want to keep the nutrients on the land. So in fact, I was just in Minnesota and I saw farmers planting rows, which is completely <laughs> monocultures are horrible anyway. Yeah. But when you plant rows going downhill, it's just, it's the worst thing you could ever do. Mm -hmm. At the very minimum, plant your rows on contour, follow the curves of the land. So uh, swales are one of the best ways to actually infiltrate your land with water becoming kind of a water bank mm -hmm. well i think it's very important also just to recognize that nature is not linear exactly it's important to just really change the, and again that's changing the mindset i mean we've been directed like this to think like this to do everything like that be, that's a programming we have to get back to more of indigenous perspectives and ways of seeing and being so 100%. you know the pandemic made tangible how isolating and disconnected from nature society yeah. has become and can be. It's not a, it's not a singular thing because not everybody is living in this way. But could you speak about how food forests restore a sense of community and also promote gift economy? Yeah, every gardener I know, ones I know anyway, we love to share seeds. We love to share plants. We love to barter and trade. And just to give like at Galt's Landing, we just uh, propagated about 250 sweet potato starts. Now, here's the fun part is we're gonna give these away to our community. We're doing kind of a, a promotional thing to our local neighbors for a lot of different reasons. One is it feels darn good. People are so <laughs> happy and thankful when you give them a plant and you share with them what that plant can do for their lives and their families' lives. Number two is, in a world where the food supply chain is being systematically destroyed, if you have a lot of food, that is not food security. If you're the only one with food and nobody else has food, that's not food security. Then you need guns. And that's a sickening thought. Now, it's still good to have guns. I'm not saying that. I'm saying have both. Have food, have a ability to protect your food, but also help your neighbors grow food not hoard. I mean, I think that's the thing. Nature does not hoard. You know, there's nothing in nature that hoards in the way that human beings have, um, have done throughout time. Yeah. So I think exactly as you said, there's an abundance mindset. And if you could talk about how that goes along with food forests, about shifting the mindset into one of abundance instead of the lack, the scarcity, the fear, which is also a type of programming that's um, perpetuated on purpose to keep certain systems running. You nailed it. Fear is the number one tool of the enslaver, of the slave master, to first rise above the fear, faith and courage, settle in who we are, understand that we are more than this, and that the ultimate thing to fear is fear itself, which means don't fear anything. Right? <laughs> so, so first of all, let's let go of the fear and then once you do that and you start seeing clearly past the programming, then it becomes a world of abundance. I see abundance everywhere. And it's more and more, the more I wake up into the infinite power of who we are as individuals and then exponentially more powerful as families and communities. And then sharing that energy, then it becomes kind of an abundance mirror. It keeps coming back. 
Mm -hmm. I think when the closer you are to nature, it, it's natural. I mean, abundance is inherent in nature and creativity, that creative force is anyone who's grown anything realizes I can barely keep up with the harvest if you have something that's really healthy. Yes. So farming used to be a family and communal affair, but de desertification caused by modern agri agriculture, I would say is emblematic of also how isolating and abiotic farming has become with industrial agriculture. So in place of intuition and adaptability, you know, we have toxic chemicals, machinery, and we have like ghosted, ghosted communities. What have been some of the changes that people have undergone who have started food forests in this short time that you guys have been, you know, yeah. in existence? So it's a life transformative situation when people interact with nature again, because what we've been taken out of the natural system and literally they are trying to put us in an unnatural system, a metaverse. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and some people, because they don't realize, they're not aware that they have another option. They choose that because they're diseased and diseased. Right. So when we actually go stand outside and walk in a forest and when, when it's it's really the most magical thing when you can like I was walking through my property the other day and just walking from my homestead site to the dock, which is a few hundred yards, I was able to eat nine different types of food. Mm -hmm. right? Just walking. Oh, here's this kind of berry. Here's this kind of lung. And here's this kind of and I was just I, I was having my lunch as I was just walking through the landscape. And not mm -hmm. just a, a lunch, most people's lunches are made with poisons. Jane Goodall said, we are going to, we shall look back on this dark era of agriculture and shake our heads. How could we have ever thought it was a good idea to grow our food with poisons? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it's because of the, what the motivation is. And we know the motivation. If, if profit is your motivation, then you're going to do some egregious things. That's just a given. You know, how are you addressing soil fertility and preparing the soil? Because I'm sure you're working with a lot of degraded dirt in different places. And are you using a, a biochemical like NBK approach? Or are you using a biological approach with building microbes in the soil? Tell me how that, that is working. It. So we have several layers. And, and this is kind of cool. We uh, being a, a kind of a standard development, we have a 10 lot development on 52 acres. Each lot is about 1.1 acres sold out. Um, so every lot, we, we had to dig a rainwater catchment pond as part of the permit requirements. And, and so we dug this three and a half acre pond. And the soil that we took out, the top layer, maybe eight inches, was pretty decent because it was a cattle pasture. Everything below that was sand and, and inner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the land. That's the that's the soil that we get to work with. Mm -hmm. So we started by putting mulch on everything. Mm -hmm. That mulch creates that layer because you do not want the sun and the wind and the rain directly hitting the soil. Mm -hmm. You want a layer on top. So we started with mulch, and then we hired a machine, and this machine had an auger, and did, da, 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 we did four hundred holes for fruit trees in two days. Mm -hmm. And we, we started with hand labor and we're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is an amazing amount of work. So right. we got the machine, <laughs> saved a ton of money and, and man hours and right. time. And um, so then we got, we, to, to speed up time, you can do the slow way. Uh, the permaculture way is beautiful. And, and by the way, if you want to speed up time, the permaculture way is buy good soil. So we did, we bought truckloads and truckloads. So we dug holes in this inert soil, the sand. And then we put good soil in there with some rocks at the bottom. Then we started a compost tea brewer. Mm -hmm. And that compost tea brewer was a 50 gallon jug mm -hmm. uh, or you know, a barrel, plastic right. barrel. And we put a compost tea bag in, we boiled that up for, uh, or brewed it up for 24 mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. And then we poured that on the plants as we were installing them. And then about once a month after that, we also have a worm casting system where we throw some scraps in, and we get a little bit of worm casting goes a long ways. It's kind mm -hmm. of to inoculate or mm -hmm. spark the soil to life. Mm -hmm. So our, it's just rocking. And we put in some rock dust and some other things. So in other words, we build soil. Soil is like the immune system for our planet. When you sure. have healthy soil, then the plants are going to be healthy. 
Are you having, is there a community building of compost? I mean, is that part of the community to be able to do things like that together? It's huge. Compost is just the most logical use of the resource, right? To put our compost in a plastic bag in a landfill, even when you go walking on the street and you see these doggy bags, plastic bags. So you're taking a natural fertilizer <laughs> and you're wrapping it in plastic and you're right. putting it in a landfill. Right. Because you don't want the discomfort of having to have that smell mm -hmm. once in a great while, mm -hmm. that is where we have to, we get to tweak our minds and say, wait a minute, what I'm smelling is a natural process for, by the way, it's usually one or two seconds, right? It's not like, and mm -hmm. so it's to become aware that the trade-off for smelling dog poop once in a great while is having mm -hmm. a, a successful world. Right, right. Well, it's nothing that microbes couldn't solve. You know, microbes solve all of it, right? Yes, exactly. Microbes to, to that to decompose. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you deal with the toxicity of urban environments, given that trees, especially here, we uh, deal with that a lot, where trees in certain environments can be just literally coated with soot from car exhaust and other particulate matter. So in urban situations, are you testing the soil first for any heavy metal presence or other chemicals? I mean, how are you dealing with that in places that are, are truly toxic? Yeah, well, we start, if we can do a wind barrier or a buffer, like fences, when you use a fence properly, it's a fantastic asset. It's a food fence. Let's say you start with a chain link fence now alongside of a road, and then you plant grapes and passion fruit and all sorts of different vines those vines use the fence as a trellis. Now you've got a buffer, you've got some security, you've got a food fence, a trellis, right? Mm -hmm. So there, or like we did in one part of our property, because we get hurricanes here once in a while, we put rows of clumping bamboo, like mm -hmm. about, I don't know, a hundred feet long of these different clumping bamboo. Mm -hmm. And that also filters the air. So you could do that. And our favorite thing is just building soil. There's something that absolutely, it's like a, an energy field. When you build proper, healthy, deep, rich soil, then everything around it, like I said, it's like the immune system becomes healthier and stronger. Exponential. But then with these food fences, like again, saying, I'm just bringing this up again and again, because we have a place like Long Beach is dealing with the Long Beach ports. We have just thousands of cars that go through here every day. And so then you have this food fence, but still, you know, at what point? because the toxins are still coming in, you know, those, so it's like, how do you really deal with that still? Even if you put up a food fence, even if you grow food, it's like, you're gonna have to like, just wash the food. It's like, you wouldn't really wanna be, uh, you know, that it's just an issue here that we, it's tangible. Yeah, so there's layers, right? If you are where you are and you cannot move, you, if you have a toxin toxicity issue, if you have a toxins coming in on a regular basis, if you can move, of course, that's the first goal. If you can't, then you do what you can to make it as healthy as possible where you are. And right. plants are the best air filters, they're the best water filters, and they're the best cleansers of everything in our system. Yeah, yeah. here it's just a bit of a different story because we have, I've had one friend who was um, an urban homesteader and he was growing all massive amounts of food. And then at some point they discovered that there was lead and they had to shut the whole thing down, you know, but that it's just... It's just something that's part of our world. But again, looking down the line, that's the reason why we're doing this is to yeah. clean, clean the soil, clean the air, clean the waters, everything yeah. that we've done to it. And lead gets encapsulated after a short time in the ground and it becomes inert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, what is, um, let's talk about the initial design of a food forest. So since it is initially, as you said, it's like, it's, it's a landscape design. It's curated by human beings initially. And do you feel we need to design with feeding our animal relatives in mind? I mean, of course you think of pollinators. I mean, what, what more do you consider as far as other animals, given that we are in the Anthropocene era? And I feel we need to take responsibility for restoring so much of the habitat that we've destroyed. Oh, absolutely. Well, when we transition 50% of the 44 million acres of lawn around the world, uh, around the United States, it, we will, the, the, the monoculture farmlands will not be needed anymore. Those will go back to forests, like the bison, the buffalo will roam again when we simply do this most logical thing. So, um, so the question, 
What, what was the question again? <laughs> About how do we consider the design for our animals? Oh, which yeah. is not just so, human beings and feeding human beings, but really, and people think about pollinators, but I don't know that they think beyond that, you know. Balance is, the, is part of the system. Like we have a compost bin in the back here and I had never seen a rat or a mouse except mm -hmm. for one time. Mm -hmm. It was in the talons of a hawk that mm -hmm. made residence over the, like right next to us. And I never seen the hawk before. So if you create the system, you're going to have times where there's a little bit of imbalance, but over time, if you allow it, nature will come in and balance it out. Well, I oh. think it's the, the balance of predator and prey. We yes. get kind of into the extremes of kill all the predators, but no, you need the predator in the ecosystem. It's how it functions. It's a, it's uh, it's a holistic it system, you know. It is. There so. must be an apex predator in a system like when they reintroduced the timber wolves to Yellowstone National Park, it changed the course of the rivers. Mm -hmm. The wolves were credited with changing the course of the rivers. People say, what do you mean? How is that possible? Well, mm -hmm. because the herbivores got so out of control that they ate everything. There was mm -hmm. no balance in the system and the riverbanks were failing. Mm -hmm. That's why I think about the Anthropocene era and being able to feed our relatives. And we, obviously, this is something that as you said, the time has come. We need to restore ecosystems everywhere, bring back the habitat, bring back the flora and fauna because uh, we don't really want to outnumber them. Yeah, <laughs> Not no. that we really could, but is anyone collecting data as the food forests are installed? Has anyone approached you to do this to track the growth of biodiversity or the health of the soil microbiology or even temperature change? Is anyone measuring? Oh, all of those things. Thanks to the Permaculture Network, which has been around for really forever, it's been named for since Bill Mollison and David Holmgren named it maybe 50 some years ago, but it's been around forever. It's the science of using our resources in a way that creates abundance. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, in fact, I just saw a meme just yesterday that in, I think it's Scotland, they're going to be cutting down like millions of trees to put up windmills. Uh, yeah, yeah, we insane that, that's energy. The yeah, trees so. take the heat of the sun and they turn that into life. Yeah. Now you're taking that and you're putting an expensive, it's just an insane. They put that same amount of energy into growing food on lawns in Scotland, then the whole country would be food secure and free and healthy, healthier than any country in the world within 10 years. Wow. I'm actually surprised that's taking place there because they have such a strong ethos there, you know, with nature, but, um, because they're, they're yeah. being sold a lie and they believe the lie. Mm -hmm. and, and we all do. I was asleep at one time and there's still areas in my life where I say, where am I missing the program here? Where am I still asleep? That is mm -hmm. such an empowering question. Because I love learning if I'm wrong or if I'm asleep, because that empowers me. It helps lift up my spirit to a new level. Yeah. Well, I think that's kind of also part of that settler colonial system that so many of us have been, we've been steeped in that for most people grew up in that, you know, but in this country, are you aligning with, we got one minute, Jim, we'll, we'll come back to this if we don't get through, but in this country, are you aligning with indigenous peoples, the places where the food forests are being installed to also bring back that? Because that indigenous wisdom, that indigenous connection is so important in this time. And I'm wondering if you are working with indigenous peoples of various lands. Absolutely. Yes, we are. And we want to more and more and more. So if, it, if there are any folks out there listening, please get in touch with us. We would love to support and help you turn your land into something that creates benefits and value for your community. So we're going to take a break right here, Jim, and talk a bit more about um, Indigenous peoples and how we can restore what, uh, what naturally needs to be restored here due to the history. Wonderful.